In England, the fairer sex have a prison of their own. The infamous Holloway prison has housed some of the most notorious female criminals, from suffragettes to serial killers. In this episode, we will be looking at this strange range of women who have served time behind these bars. Hey doll, just some water. A few months ago, I dedicated an episode to Myra Hindley's eventful time in prison. There was romance, there was scandal, betrayal, Rose West, escape plans, corruption, Christianity. Like, the episode could have been so much longer, but I wanted to keep it just snip snappy, like, short. But doll, upon my reading, I found these inmates to be fascinating. I immediately wanted to do a whole episode on the women in Holloway. There were so many women in Holloway for such a variety of different crimes. So I thought I would do a cursory preview glance at some of the women housed at Holloway. Myra Hindley will not be in this episode as she already got her own. And she has gotten quite enough attention. Thank you very much. Enough, Myra. H. M. His Majesties now. I'm used to saying Her Majesties. His Majesties Prison Holloway in London, England, opened its doors in 1852. Or rather, closed its doors because it's a prison. Get it? <laughs> Holloway was the largest women's prison in Western Europe until its closure in 2016. Holloway was initially used to imprison female suffragettes and political activists who broke the law. Also, some very famous men have graced these prison hallways. Fascinating history, but not the focus of today's episode, maybe in the future. We will start off light with one most of us know, Maxine Carr. Maxine Carr was the girlfriend of Ian Huntley, a school caretaker who murdered schoolgirls Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman in 2002. It was and still is a massive case in UK history and true crime history. Maxine was the 10 year old girl's teaching assistant. Maxine knew that Ian had killed the girls, but she claims that he told her it was an accident and she says she believes it, or at least did, but she said she did believe him, which is apparently why she provided him with a false alibi on his whereabouts on the day of the girl's disappearance. When interrogated by police, Maxine quickly confessed to her deceit, which saw her jailed in Holloway prison for three and a half years for perverting the course of justice, which she did. Ian got 40 years and had a horrible time in prison. Yay! Maxine served 22 months of her jail term. According to some sources, Maxine was deeply remorseful and regretful and couldn't even say Ian's name. She cursed him for what he did and also for ruining her life. However, according to other sources, she also allegedly wrote to Ian for a few months while in prison. During her stint in Holloway, there was an attempted scalding hot water attack made on Maxine. Evidently, most of the women in Holloway did not like Maxine. Maxine defended, protected somebody who hurt two children in the worst ways possible. And other Holloway inmates said that they believed that Maxine was not remorseful, was not regretful and had a bad attitude. Maxine was released from Holloway in 2004 and given a new identity amid concerns that she would be attacked, which she probably would have been. She is just one of four ex-UK prisoners protected by lifelong anonymity. Reports say that since leaving Holloway, she hasn't re-offended like, and she has rebuilt her life and married. Dana Thompson. This woman is crazy. Oh my gosh. This 
This could be a movie. Maybe it is. Dana Thompson was born Dana Holmes in London, 1960. Dana married her first husband, electrician Lee Wyatt, in 1984, having met two years prior. Right off the bat, we are getting weird. We are getting twisted. Somehow, Dana, 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 somehow Dana convinced Lee that he had been offered £50 million for a toy that he had, like, invented and patented. This was not true, but also drama because the mafia, yes, had threatened to kill Lee and Dana's son unless he split the money with them. So Dana convinced Lee that in order to escape the mafia, Lee needed to become homeless and sleep on the streets, avoiding the mafia, while Dana and their son made a new life in America. Like, like, and she didn't go to America, as far as I'm aware. Like, what? During this time that her husband Lee was living on the streets, Dana bigamously married advertiser Julian Webb in 1991. It seems that she was like quickly over this marriage as only three years later, on Julian's 31st birthday, she poisoned his birthday curry with a mix of ground up antidepressants and aspirin. And as Julian lay dying on his bed, his mother called him to wish him a happy birthday. Dana told her that Julian was too unwell to even speak on the phone. Julian's mother was obviously worried and said, well then, uh, ring a doctor if he's that unwell. Obviously, Dana didn't call a doctor and Julian died. The very next day that he's dead, not even in the ground, Dana tried to collect £35,000 from Julian's life insurance. The inquest investigation into Julian's death revealed an open verdict. Dana said that maybe Julian did it himself, that he was depressed. So it was impossible to know if it was murder or or not. Dana then attempted to have Julian's remains cremated. Thankfully, this was stopped by Julian's mother, who was able to prove that Dana was still married. This avoided the marriage. Also, it's illegal. Uh, so Dana couldn't get her hands on the life insurance nor cremation process. This was when Lee Wyatt shuffled in off the streets, like on the run from the mafia for years at this point. He, in court, Lee was given the opportunity to share the stories of how manipulative his wife Dana had been. She had like legally accused him of being violent, which he wasn't, and accused him of stealing 23K from her employer. Shock her, it was her, she stole the money. Finally, Lee was able to break free and got a divorce and Dana spent 18 months in prison. But we are not slowing down. Once Dana was freed, she went on to marry again. In 1998, she married, technically, legally, I suppose, now that she's divorced, Richard Thompson. And after two years of marriage, guess what? She was done. Done. Done with the marriage. On the first day... This story is so crazy. On the first day of the millennium, the 1st of January 2000, talk about New Year's resolution. Pretending it was all just a sexy game, Dana bound and gagged her husband. She then returned to the room with a knife and a baseball bat. After a dramatic fight, Richard was thankfully able to break free and restrain Dana. Dana... <laughs> Dana broke down, bawling her eyes out. It's all been a lie. I've spent all your money. I'm not too sure what happened after this interaction. I think Dana left the house. But the very next day, a real estate agent came to the house and Richard answered the door. And the estate agent was like, oh, your wife told me that you would be in America 
and that you wanted me to sell the house while you were gone. Like, she was proper planning this murder. Like, she had steps. This was premeditated. Richard called the police and Dana was arrested again. This time for attempted murder. Now, Dana was a busy little spider. Get it? Because she's a black widow. She was also emptying the bank accounts of other men, of boyfriends. She not only had husbands, she had boyfriends. I can barely manage my one marriage. How is she? How? how? Well, she does have eight arms and legs because she's a spider. Get it? Dana admitted she was a con man and emptied multiple bank accounts, but she denied the attempted murder, saying that when Richard found out that she had stolen all of his money, he had tried to kill her. And so she fought against him and stabbed him in self-defense. I mean, there is no way that a jury is going to believe this, right? I mean, she's already done time for manipulating her first husband into being homeless. Her second husband died suspiciously. Her third husband has now been stabbed and she's conned multiple men. Oh, no, wait, what's that? The jury, they, they believed her. <laughs> Dana was acquitted of the attempted murder charge. Come on! She served three years and nine months for 15 counts of deception. 15. That is a lot of people. And that is only the people we know about. That's only the people who came forward, who could come forward. Now, don't panic. She hasn't gotten away with murder just yet. In all this hullabaloo and digging up dirt on Dana and her manipulative con man ways, got investigators rethinking about the suspicious death of her se second husband, I suppose, bigamous husband, Julian Webb, who died six years prior. Investigators exhumed the body and a witness came forward saying that Dana had said to her that she had done it. She like confessed to her friend. Idiot, why do people confess to their friends? Finally, Dana was convicted of murder in 2003 and sentenced to life in H.M. Holloway Prison. The press dubbed her the Black Widow, but I also like the BBC's tongue-in-cheek and a little bit insensitive curry killer. Since her incarceration, police have continued to look for more victims. They believe there are more. They found that Stoyan Kostov, who Dana had dated in the late 70s, early 80s, had not been seen since they last dated. Stoyan has still never been found. Then in June 2022, at 60 years old, Dana was released. Last seen in Poundland, the Pearl Board said she had been a model inmate, although deceptive. So she is out there somewhere. Probably in Poundland, Pound, Poundland, uh, Poundland, trying to get a man. Wild, wild story. Francois Dior. And yes, she is related to the Christian Dior. Francois Dior's attraction to Nazism began in her early childhood during the Nazi occupation of France. Apparently one of Dior's sweetest memories was when she received a compliment. What a beautiful Aryan girl made to her by an SS man in Paris. Oh my God, Francois, live a little bigger. <laughs> Francois had a short five-year marriage with a count descendant from the Prince of Monaco, fancy, with whom she had one daughter. In 1962, Francois became enraptured by a Trafalgar Square neo-Nazi rally. She flew over from France and immediately became a member of the group led by Colin Jordan. Obviously, romance was in the air, and soon the pair were an item. And Colin proposed an Aryan marriage on a flight in September of 63. They wed a month later in a civil ceremony held in Coventry, where a huge amount of demonstrators, like so many demonstrators, 
hurled rotten eggs and apples at the couple as they gave a Nazi salute. How fucking bananas is this? What was going on? It's Christian Dior's niece is a Nazi, a famous Nazi. Francois and Colin had a second wedding the very next day at the NSM headquarters in London. The press footage of the ceremony illustrated them mingling blood after cutting their ring fingers with the dagger before letting a unity drop fall on a copy of Mein Kampf. Francois gave a statement to the police saying, all that I want is to have little Nazi children. Needless to say, the Dior family publicly disowned her. Like they were ashamed of her. She was not invited to Christmas dinner. Francois had family members who had survived Nazi invasions, survived the Holocaust and fought against the Nazis. Francois was a spoilt, disrespectful, privileged Nazi little bitch. Francois and Colin tried to set up more Nazi groups with social elites, like an elite Nazi group. But after three years continuously campaigning for members, they only had 42 social misfits. This major fail didn't deter Frances, nor make her think that her Nazi ideologies were wrong. Instead, she doubled down. On the 31st of July, 1965, Francois was involved in an arson attack on the Ilford and Lee Bridge Road synagogues in North London. Just setting synagogues on fire. I don't believe anyone was hurt, but it's so shameful. And she fled to France because she's a little bitch. Where she was arrested and served time for displaying neo-Nazi leaflets. Upon release, she committed bigamy, just like Dana. She eloped in Jersey with a NSM member, Terence Cooper. The new and neo-Nazi couple, the new neo-Nazi, neo-neo-Nazi, then moved into a council house in Dagenham, East London. This was when her Nazi friends and uh, group members squealed. They told the police about the synagogue fires, saying that Francois incited, convinced them to commit the arson attack. Then, in January 1968, Francois received an 18-month jail sentence and was sent to Holloway Prison, which means her time overlapped with Myra Hindley's, who was also a Nazi. While in jail, Francois was nicknamed Nazi Nell, which I'm sure she friggin' loved. After she got out and by the 1980s, Francois Dior was financially ruined after a bad investment in a Parisian nightclub. Ha, sucker. In 1983, she married another Count, Count Herbert de Melu. She died 10 years later of lung cancer, January 1993, aged 60. Just like Myra Hindley, also at 60. And she was also blonde. Why is her face tilted up like that all the time? Or does she just look like that? Like she's in... I'm not gonna do the salute. <laughs> yeah, she's with her nose in the... I'm Francois Dior. Now, I actually wanted to do a list of five women, but these stories were just too wild to shorten. Like, Dana Thompson and Francois Dior. Like, how am I meant to shorten those? Aren't you glad I didn't? But yeah, if you would like another episode on more of these fascinating, just, just colourful women of Prison Holloway, let me know. Wild stuff. I definitely have enough for a part two. Maybe a suffragettes thing? So thirsty. Like, subscribe, share, slam. And thank you to my Patreon supporters. Their names are on the screen now. Thank you for hanging in there. It has been quite a few months of transition for me, but knowing that I have friends in the space is just so uplifting. Okay, bye. <laughs>